I got to put that on. It's good to be one of those individuals who's able to stand in a room and to correct my own mistakes. Um, and a mistake that I made when I was originally teaching this class, um, for example, um, major, was I said silk would be a very tall material to actually wear um, on why would the Romans in this country 100 years maybe 1,900 years ago actually wear silk? It was a material that's cold on the skin. And I was corrected by four people in that room saying actually silk is used by mountaineering. Mountain mountaineering is not the same as it. Exactly. It's used by mountaineers. I don't know what that is. I'm actually yes. And I say yes. And silk itself is a good insulating material. And it breathes, and it doesn't sweat, and it's good and it's wrong. And I'm going to make that, I'm glad I learned that myself. So, back to silk artifacts being found in Britain. The one reason, one of the main examples of silk being found in the Roman context was in Britain. Now, it was a very, very small artifact. Uh, and when they found it, they found that um, the very fine strands involved in its um, makeup were the typical white stuff that you see here, almost as if it looked, almost as if it looked with a very colourful. Uh, and that silk object itself would have been owned by somebody who was fairly wealthy. Because silk itself, in the Roman period, even though it's travelled thousands and thousands of miles, and even though uh, trade was a very popular thing in the Roman world, uh, and that there was lots of silk around, silk itself was very, very expensive. Uh, years ago, uh, when I got married, I took the bride uh, as, um, as silk, uh, Indian silk, which was very, very expensive to make and it's already dress. Uh, and uh, I think that was the first you ever could make on the dress itself. Even today, silk is very, very expensive, but it is found in our building. Uh, we, we looked at the Aksumite Kingdom the other week. Um, and I know you've seen it online, and you, you, the, the, the other three of you have actually um, were here that day when I did the Aksumite lecture. And when we looked at the Aksumite world, I was talking about the Aksumite world uh, being an, part of the axle along the route of trade. It was where trade for gold and silk and pottery and everything went through. Uh, so the Aksumite kingdom... Uh, by uh, um, at the mouth of the Red Sea, and that would have controlled trade from about the AD 100s to about the AD 700s, where where lots of trade went through, including silk. Silk itself, um, if I want to be one of these people who talk about peace, uh, silk itself, one of those objects, um, one of those materials, one of those uh, one of those examples of industry, one of those examples of little uh, farms producing something. It's used by all religions. Um, it's something that um, can be seen across the, this sort of part of the world, Europe and Asia, in Africa. It's seen all the way around. Uh, but the one thing about silk, it's seen as a status symbol, particularly in the West, because naturally in the Roman period and the medieval period, it would be a very expensive item to come by. And talking about very important and expensive things uh, would be this. This is known as the Mwangai silk map, dating from the year 100 years BC. And in 100 years BC, um, they had silk and they were creating maps. Uh, and what I've got is a little... Um, my my step my step brother said, "Oh, you can have this um, because we found that you were showing it in the sister's eye, which wasn't good." <clears throat> but as you can see here, um, as maps go, this is from 100 years BC. This is from the, the period of the um, Han Dynasty in China. Uh, is this a historical artifact, an archaeological artifact? Um, is it an artifact that's carved? It's all free. 
Um, and you can see this is an area uh, of the hand industry um, in the western part of China. Very difficult to work out what you see. And you can see great rivers as the tributaries go off. Uh, and, so, and you can see more rivers, and there's, there's indications of towns and all sorts of things on there. But this actually survives. Uh, the silk itself, if it's kept properly, can survive for a long period of time as well. So that's great. Uh, we've got living and breathing surviving artifacts that are over 2,000 years old. So silk can last a, a long time. Um, and just a couple of, couple of things in here. They have been excavating um, sites in China very, very recently. Um, what, but what we need to do is try and get a bit more context. Those sites that they've been excavating in China very, very recently. Um, there you go. There's good old China there. Um, they've actually found that silk itself was being manufactured in a... Um, in commas, manufactured um, as far ago as 8,500 years ago, silk. Silk itself is an ancient material. Silk itself is a material that goes through the ages. And in some of the tombs that they've been excavating in China, what they have found is that maybe the silk itself was used... Um, as shrouds. Um, was it used as shrouds for rich people or for poor people? I've already said that silk is used by the upper echelons in the West, but I didn't say that silk is just used by the upper echelons in the East, because there would be more silk around. Any of you who have been to an Indian wedding or something close uh, will know that everybody seems to wear silk in the Indian culture, um, simply because the lower echelons had silk as well when silk was becoming populous in India and obviously all the way across China from an early period onwards. So looking at this map, uh, we can't do much more with the map other than show you down here. Now silk is very important um, for a number of other levels. And I'm going to give you an example of archaeology, where archaeology can get it right or wrong. So you're going to take two stories here. In 1930, they were excavating um, a high-status burial in Egypt. And while they were excavating that high-status burial in Egypt, uh, they put the mummy in a museum after it had been um, excavated in a sarcophagus, um, they put it in a museum um, and they unwrap the mummy and, they, and, it, and its hair and the flesh and everything was still there. And they put it in a mu museum and forgot about it. Years later, when they were looking at the mummy, they were actually looking, uh, looking through the hair and they actually found um, little flecks of silk. Tiny little strands of silk. And that mummy itself dates from around 1,080 years BC. So that says that silk had made its way to, to um, Egypt 3,000 years ago. It's what some archaeologists believe. But there's another problem. The silk may have ended up in the hair because it was wrapped in silk after it had been excavated after the mummy's uh, wrappings have been taken off, and it may have been wrapped in silk, hence why you've got flecks of silk in the hair. But we can't prove that. It might be, in fact, that even the Egyptians were using silk themselves. Going over to Germany itself, which is just on the edge of the screen, Germany itself is believed that Germany, um, there are examples of silk being used on corpses um, in Germany as far ago as 2,750 years ago. So silk itself, this is why we're doing this, silk itself has made it all the way from China all the way to Germany 2,700 years ago 
Maybe it's made it all the way over to Egypt 3,000 years ago. And obviously it's made it all the way over to um, Roman Britain um, around 1,950 years ago. Because we found examples of it in Britain, which is great. Trade and what's going on. Now, silk itself is really, really important. And why is the silk route very, very important? It tells us so many things. Not just about the silk itself, but about the travellers. Now, in history, and I'm going to jump something in here because somebody interrupted one of my classes in the week. And they said, can you, can you not go any further with um, what traders and what the silk route can tell us? Can I just say this? And I said, okay. Um, and they said, I was watching a programme in the week. This was last week. And she said, she was watching this programme, and she said, well, um, Alice Roberts said um, that when people are moving around, they're moving around with small numbers. They're not moving around to kill and murder and maim. They're moving around to settle, to trade, to get on with their lives. And I said, well, actually, we've done that with the Vikings as well. We've done that with the, with the Vikings settling up and down the Irish coastline, just settling, not fighting, not warfaring. And then I made the statement, I said, actually, history is written by men. Archaeology is written by men. Men have got two things on their minds when they're writing about history. Sex and warfare. Everything's got to do with warfare. We're talking about Genghis and Gen Genghis Khan 700 years ago. And we're talking about wiping out thousands of people here and there, right? But if that's all they did, if they weren't a civilizing influence, the silk would have never made it anywhere. Populations wouldn't have exploded. The plague would never have happened. And this is where the silk route gets very, very interesting. How many of you can remember your history lessons? How many of you can remember a history teacher standing here showing you an image of a flea and people with buboids on them illustrating the plague which hit Wales in 1349? You remember any of that? No? None of you sketching the flea? No, I did all that, right? But I did, I had, a, I had a full page and I did a huge flea there and the history teacher thought it was a bit big. So they're only that small. And, um, and what we were always told was that how the plague spread all the way from China because that's where it originated. Over here, that's where it originated. They, my history teachers used to say that the plague spread from China all the way along here all the way along the sea route into Europe, okay? And then it wiped out two-thirds of the European population, and in Wales, up to 90% of our population. Wales is a bit of a strange one because it was hit by all the plagues at once, all three strands of plague, bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic plague, where the English had a bit of bubonic, some people recovered, then they had pneumonic, some people recovered, and they had septicemic, which you stayed away from. Wales, we had it all in one day, basically, so you had a 90% chance of dying. But I've said all that. What I need to say is that we don't have any proof. We actually know that the plagues originated over here, the Eurestis pestis, strain of the bacteria originated over here. But how did it get over here? You could say it was a silk route and the sea route, but where's the proof? Where is the proof? And the archaeologists have started to excavate sites along this entire route all the way through to Persia and all the way through into the Roman, route, Ro Roman world. And they've been excavating along this route. And they've started to look at the cesspits. And they've started to look at the rubbish dumps. And I'll be crude, they started to look at the fecal matter of human beings. And they started to see tapeworm, flatworm, all types of guttural worms that 
human beings carry with them. There's four main strains. And they started to find the eggs. And they started to realize that these people were carrying things in their intestinal tract. And if they were able to carry these things in their intestinal tract over thousands of miles, they were obviously capable of carrying a plague. There is your archaeological evidence. It's not in the history, it's in the archaeology. It's in, I'm going to say it, the shit that human beings leave behind. And yes, human beings do leave a lot of crap around. They leave their pottery, they leave their bones, they leave their material around, their silk and leather and all the rest of it. But we're starting to learn a lot more. In the year 540, to uh, 1,500 1, years ago, there was, there was an outbreak of some kind of plague. You know, 800 years, 900 years before the, the, the big one hit the world, right? The big one. In, in AD 540, it's known as the Justinian plague. It hit Constantinople. <laughs> and millions of people across the Roman world died, dying in the streets. Okay, they don't, we don't know what it was. It must have been waterborne. Some say it was a plague. Some say it was flea driven. We don't really know. But even then, millions of people were wiped out. And guess what? The people in Byzantium loved. They loved their silk. Gold doesn't really carry fleas, does it? Doesn't really carry fleas. And, and, I, and I don't know if I did that here last week, or I don't know if I've done it at all. Um, I have little cuttings given to me every week. Some are really crap. Uh, but I had a really interesting cutting given to me. And it was in, from the Daily Mail. And I was reading this out, and it was really obvious. But there was something interesting about it. Come on, Paul. What carried the plague? What, what, what carried the plague? I think it was something to do with the truth. On what? Rats. Rats. Apparently, that's not right. That isn't right. It was the flea, but it was the flea carried on a human being, right? Because what they've now worked out, uh, they've worked out this. They've worked out, if, you, if you've got a flat, a, a, a flat, if you've got a rat going into an area, right, and it's got fleas, naturally the other fleas will hop from rat to all the rest of it. They, they've done this little sort of, um, these charts and correlations, and they worked out the rat flea will spread the plague very, very slowly amongst the other rats, and then they will eventually come in contact with humans. It's a slow progression, right? But human-to-human -human contact um, is easy. You've got one person uh, with a cloak on, uh, especially for the You, okay. A rat, on the other hand, would be scurrying around, and it's not going to go anywhere near you, Paul, right? It's going to scurry around, it's going to scurry around. And the problem is, they've now worked out that the flea itself was carried by a human being. So the rat should not be blamed. And the other thing as well is, for rats, and this is an obvious thing as well, for <coughs> rats to move along this entire route, They've got to go hundreds of miles without any villages, with any towns. So you've got these little rats going, right, we're going to just go down the road, right? Just 100 miles with no food, right? We're going to go to the next way station. It's so obvious. They, the rats didn't do that. It was humans that carried these fleas, okay? Um, and septicemic plague was, was carried pu uh, purely in the blood, but naturally um, septicemic plague is a killer within about four or five days. Um, and it, as, as you can tell, septicemia uh, is going to be a quite a rapid one. So this is what we're finding about all the archaeological evidence along this route. Not just the sea route through the Axumite world, okay, but eventually into the 1300s. About 1320, we've got a very famous explorer known as Marco Polo which I'm sure some of you have come across, Marco Polo. And Marco Polo writes about something happening in the East. He writes about some horrible thing happening in the East. 
not really graphic about it, but it takes 20 years to get from the east to here. But it gets here, and it decimates the whole of Europe. Um, and I'm going to chuck one thing in here. Um, when Owen Glyndwr gets blamed um, for the destruction of Wales and burning down villages and destroying wonderful, lovely Cardiff, um, only 50 years before, the plague hit Wales. 90% of the population were wiped out. And it wasn't Owen Glyndwr doing the killing, it had been the plague. That's why Owen Glyndwr is blamed for the destruction of many towns and villages. It had already been done by the plague. And the villages were already destroyed before Owen Glyndwr ever got to them. But he's always blamed for it. Moving on. Along the silk route, we do actually have evidence um, of where the silk route started. We have statues, uh, we have carvings, and it's got to be said that one piece of archaeology, the only piece of archaeology that can be seen from the moon, which is the Great Wall of China, that can be seen from the moon. That was created to protect the trade in silk. Not the trade in gold, not the trade in pottery. It was built to protect the trade in silk. Silk was more valuable back then. And I've not done the maths on this. And weight-wise, I'm sure silk would be more valuable than gold or any metal today. Okay? It's, it's worth its weight in gold. Okay, we've all heard that one, but it's worth more than the weight in gold. Um, you know, there, you, you can think about the idea of actually having banknotes in silk. Uh, the, the value is in the silk, in the banknotes. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Okay, our banknotes today were made out of silk because they're worth nothing. Um, now, Great Wall of China and the level of wealth created by the silk to build the Great Wall of China is for all to see. Now, the Han Dynasty of China um, was a dynasty that um, existed from about 200 years BC to about 200 years AD. It lasted for 400 years and it built up its wealth and power and its armies, and more of the Great Wall of China, and its cities, and its towns, and its roads, and its navy, all based on silk. And it was a civilizing influence as well. When we think about civilizing influences, we think of the Roman Empire invading a country here and invading a country there. Silk was a leveller. Along the entire Silk Route, traders were almost allowed to trade. Whatever religion you were, you were able to go from one point to another. You were able to go into the Roman world, to the Indian world, to the Chinese world, to the Egyptian world, to the Aksumite world. You were able to go all the way around the world in your finery. And let's go back a little bit to Roman Britain. People who had silk traded, we go back to this chart again, so that that's at the beginning of the silk route, over in Suzio, over here. That's at the beginning of the silk route, in Suzio, the statue, statue you just see. Um, if you note, the silk route is going into uh, Mongolia, then it goes over to Tibet, and it goes all the way over to Afghanistan, all the way into the north of Iran, and then all the way into the nice warm areas. Silk is traded in some of the remotest, coldest parts of the world, but they're able to transport it. It's easy to transport. And it's quite likely as well, if you've got a donkey or a camel with the panniers on the side of the donkey or the camel, which have got huge wads 
of silk. It might be that those silk objects, garments, rugs, or whatever they are, may have actually carried fleas within the silk itself. And no sooner as the silk had been unwrapped, the, sea, the, the fleas from their very cold, dormant state, thinking, hmm, I can feel something warm. It's a human being. Let's go and bite them. Let's go and feed. That's how diseases are spread. That's how Eurestis pestis would be spread all the way across this landscape. And it's a great network. Kitsesiphon, if, if any of you have actually um, watched any of my videos online, I've, I've got a video about Kitsesiphon. It's known as the uh, Arch of Kitsesiphon. Um, and this wonderful um, Arch of Kitsesiphon um, is, a, is more or less a freestanding arch which dates from around uh, 1,400 years ago. It's made of mud brick. And that was constructed out of the wealth of silk as well. And it's interesting that um, along this route, they've actually been excavating uh, statuary at some of the archaeological sites associated um, with what people were worshipping uh, whilst they were heading along this wonderful trade route. Uh, this is uh, a wooden statue of a Buddha, as you can clearly see. Um, and whilst they've been excavating these sites, uh, I'm going to go into something a little bit um, a cesspity in a second. Um, whilst they've been excavating along this route, um, they, they, they can find way stations where you can find Buddhist statues, Hindu um, statues, and you go into Muslim areas associated with the Muslim faith, Christian faith, and all the rest of it. So it's one of those levelers. Um, you know, lots of religions were interested um, in the silk. All the way along uh, this landscape, uh, each of these triangles represent a village or a town associated with the silk trade, where we've got silk artifacts being found. There's Afghanistan, there's going all the way through to China, some of the really cold areas. Uh, you wouldn't want to be um, you wouldn't want to be in the winter months in these very cold areas. You wouldn't survive. You'd freeze to death. Not unless you're wearing silk. What's that? Unless you're wearing silk. Unless you're wearing silk. I knew one of you was going to say that. Unless you're wearing silk. Can any of you tell me what these are? Something to do with a byproduct of the manufacture of silk. You would have needed one, all of us, but you wouldn't have wanted to share it with anyone. Pardon? Steve. Steve. I've taken you off on the wrong route. I'm really sorry. I've taken you off on the wrong route. Basically, these, these are being excavated um, from the silk route, from a site um, dating to about 1,500 years ago. Um, and these were excavated near a cesspit. Um, and these would have had some cloth on the end of them. These are poo sticks. Don't think of poo stick bridge, okay? These are poo sticks. Um, and when they excavated some of these, uh, they, they actually started to find eggs in some of the material that was still surviving with these poo sticks. Okay? So if you're ever, if you're ever in a latrine, right, um, and somebody offers you their poo stick to use, it's perfectly clean, don't. Because you need to use your own. Um, and whilst, the, whilst, they were, um, whilst they were examining one of these poo sticks, they, they actually found that they had the, the unique eggs of a certain um, flat intestinal worm um, that originates in China. Uh, now, this is at a way station in Afghanistan. This is way up in, in the arid sort of mountainous regions of Afghanistan, nowhere near water. And they say that this worm lives in streams and rivers in China. 
that's why you've got to boil your water in some of these regions of China. Because if you get the um, intestinal um, parasite inside your body, okay, um, it, it carries all sorts of horrible things. And they found actually some of the eggs in the cloth um, when they were excavating these poo sticks. Um, and they thought, right, this is, this is interesting stuff. Because the, these, pa these parasitical, these parasitical eggs are not laid in water around Afghanistan uh, because it's too arid. There are not enough water pools. Um, and obviously, travellers had moved all the way from China, about, just coming up to Afghanistan, and they'd carried the, uh, their, these eggs in their system. Um, and the parasitic worm... Um, where it originates from was 2,000 miles away from this site. And it's said that if, you, if you've got these parasites in your system, you have continuous stomach aches, uh, you, you vomit, um, you're in a lot of pain. So whoever had these intestinal worms in their body um, had carried them for 2,000 miles and were in excruciating pain for the whole journey. Tape worms, yes. Bat worms. There's there four main types. Yeah. How long were they there? I mean, they look quite long. They, 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 they are quite long. Quite long. You'd have, you'd have needed... When, I, when I'm very vague about the material, so obviously you might have... Um, uh, you, you might have some, something like flax on the end. You might have something um, slightly cottony on the end. You would have wool. Uh, you might have horse hair or something on the end. Camel hair would be good. But you can see there that that's more like a, a goat type of hair on some of these. And it would be basically bound. Basically what you're talk, talking about, you're talking about a long stick. Um, and, it, and, it, and whatever you've got on the end is bound on and tied on. And you would need to carry that with you um, to wipe you behind. And you'd need to put it in liquid um, the, what the Romans would have done, you'd have had all, all Roman soldiers would have had one of these, but this is thousands of miles away from the Roman world. All Roman soldiers would have had one of these, and we found examples of them, for example, um, along Hadrian's Wall. Uh, and basically, it's a, it's a small stick about so long. Um, you may have had a sponge on the end because there were there are natural sponges in the Mediterranean. So you may have had a sponge on the end if you were lucky. That would have been bound on, and you'd have dipped it in oil um, or vinegar or something like that. Um, usually vinegar, maybe oil or something. You'd have dipped it in there, and that would have been used to clean your backside. Yeah. Yeah. The vinegar, the vinegar's the one. The vinegar's the one. The thing, the thing is, then somebody commented. They, they said, well, maybe that's the reason why um, in the Islamic world um, they, they use water instead of tissue to clean their behinds. Because they probably learnt it's better to use water than it is to use one of these. Because yeah. it's more hygienic to use water than one of these. You'd have had to have carried these with you. They weren't optional. They, they, they just didn't weren't hanging on the wall, you know, there's a disposable one over there, like, it's only been used five times, it's disposable, you can just leave it there afterwards, right? So this is what's going on. Um, back to another intriguing thing, more, more away from these sticks, um, they, they've been, again, excavating lots of these Chinese sites. The Chinese, I think the Chinese archaeologists are some of the most unbiased archaeologists, believe it or not. Um... They, they, they tell people what they're finding. Unlike what we do in this country, uh, we find um, the remains of a woman Viking warrior. Um, and we say, actually, she's not a Viking warrior. That sword that she's buried with um, and the axe that she's buried with and, and the, um, the um, shield boss that she's buried with belonged to a dad. They put it in with her, right, because she wanted them when she died and they belonged to her dad, right? And then somebody turns around and says, actually, have you seen the, the, the bone structure, right? Uh, it's obvious that she was a warrior. No, 
She's got bone structure like that because she had some kind of deformity, right? If, if a body like that was found in China, they would immediately say, actually, it's, it's a Chinese female warrior. They would have no bounds or bridges against that. And that leads me on to this. When they've been excavating some of these sites associated with the silk route, they were excavating one intriguing site. And they, 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 they found an area where there were four specific bodies. They were all western, uh, southeastern looking. They, they did not look Chinese. They were bigger. They were excavating away. And they thought, right, actually, about 1,600 years ago, right, we've got somebody who's buried on this site from India. We've done all the dating. We know they're from India. We've got somebody from this site who's actually from the Persian world, Iran. And we've got somebody from the Roman world buried in China. The Roman world buried in China. Um, and that's significant. Because overnight, within a moment, we've not got evidence of diseases being spread along this route. Uh, we've got evidence of people traveling long distances. That cosmopolitan world which I mentioned with the Aksumites, a cosmopolitan world that was absolutely everywhere um, 1,600 years ago. So we talk about intermingling now in a cosmopolitan world. It happened then. You know, I, 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 I've, I've said to my partner, Michelle, I've said, when you, when you, do, this cover, when you do the cover of the book, right? Uh, because uh, uh, those are the, the people that are on, on the book on the road to the Red Wall. If any of you want to talk to you, if any of you want to see Red, um, and you get mates rates if you're a member. Okay, members get one for seven quid. Non-members, ten. Um, and I said to her, I said, when you when we do the next one, we're going to be uh, the battle of stalling down. We've got the other one, ghost of Stanford. Um, you know what things we will do as well. We're going to have one or two people in the last one. And nobody will have ever done that or written about that in a book. Because Owen Glyndor's army had people in it that were from France who would have had dark skin. What I'm trying to say there is that we, we are living in a very cosmopolitan <coughs> world. And the cosmopolitan world has gone all the way back. And we can see this if we've got white Caucasoid people from Europe being buried in China. There's no reason why you can't have Chinese people being buried in Great Britain. And do you know what? I think it was last year, or a couple of years before, a couple of years ago, they were excavating in London a Roman cemetery. And guess what they found? The remains of people who originated from China. And they must have come along that Silk Route. They must have travelled all the way along that silk route. This is why, when somebody said, "Let's do silk," I thought, "Oh my God, how am I going to do this?" My little brains, my little grey cells were going, "Where have I read this stuff before?" And I was like, "Right, you, you've got you've got Chinese people in the Roman world, and why would they have got you? It's all to do with that trade in silk or other similar things." And then you've got the, the Europeans being buried in China. Um, so what we're going to do? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a quick break, okay, um, and then we'll come back to this. Does anyone want a cup of tea? Let's have a quick tea. Come on, quick tea. Come on, lights. We won't be alone.
did say that he would only say verse. I mean, you know, some business forms and just said that they don't think that they were compatible by God. You, you might, you might, you might have to lose a bit of flight tickets to travel this country. Take two more in. Exactly. Is, is it by one of the, is it by one of being told that they might be, they might be um, completely changed on your hours? And can I think of any uh, different times for motivation and exercise and all that? Is that what they said? <laughs> mm. Where is this trial popular? Let's be. Shall I, shall I describe it? Thank you. 
So what, what we're going to do now... Oh, nice! By the way, what we're going to do, right? We're going to get... We're going to get... We're going to get... We're going to get... You better have your hands on your hands. Have you ever seen that? It's, it's the after one of the Harry Old version. I've never seen that. Uh, 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 yeah, it's really good. Um, yeah, Harry Old version. Yeah, it's really good. Harry Old version. Yeah, Harry Old version. Yeah, Harry Old version. Are you leaving me here? Oh, for God's sake, make up your mind. And you're all doing sea Kyle as they go past you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the man still did it, whether he'd say it, that probably he would. Uh, no, he wouldn't. Yeah, he would. No, he wouldn't. Anyway, yeah. Silk itself. Oh, we finished this one. What's that? Yeah, exactly. Don't tell me, you're a Liberal Democrat. I've never voted in my life. Well, that's fair enough then. All right, let's just finish. What in Arriva Trains, Wales? Well, okay. Um, the Mulberry Grub. Okay. Now, this is one area we want to do. To, we like a bit of fantasy. Let us do do a bit of fantasy now. The the interesting thing um, with these wonderful moths is that they they lay their grubs on the mulberry bush. Uh, and the grubs love eating the mulberry leaves and they leave their cocoons where, with their chrysalises or chrysalis eyes. Um, they, they lay them, they, they, the grubs are nicely munching away at the mulberry leaves and then they create a cocoon uh, and then these form into wonderful moths. That's that, okay? So I'm going to give you a couple of legends associated with how we get silk. It's believed um, that a Chinese empress over 2,000 years ago, note that we, we know we've had silk for 8,500 years, but the Chinese had to invent something. Over 2,000 years ago, um, the Chinese had an empress. She was there... Drinking a cup of tea out of, out of a cup like this. Maybe not. Um, she was there nicely drinking a cup of tea, going like this. And as she put it down, a cocoon fell into her tea. And she gently looked at the cocoon, and she took the cocoon out, and she put it in the palm of her hand, and she unraveled the cocoon. And she had one of her little slaves, 
take the end of this, go on, thank you. And apparently she unraveled it and the yarn that was created stretched 1,600 meters in length from one single cocoon. And in coming to the end, she looked at the grub and ate it. No, that, that last bit isn't in there, but, but the grub's really annoyed um, that his cocoon has been nicked, right? But anyway, the point is that that's where it comes from. But, but that gives you an idea of how much yarn can come from one cocoon. Maybe it's, however many meterage you're getting out from a cocoon, it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be quite a lot, okay? Um, and that's the yarn that you're using to create your silk. It's as simple as that. In my research, however, you can get similar like silks from arachnids, like spiders, as you know. Quite, quite strong, powerful yarn. Um, and you can, and I was actually reading as well, you know those little silver fish that you, that you find in a drawer? Yeah? Eating away at documents? You can actually get some of it from them as well. So there's loads of different insects that create this yarn. It's an organic yarn. And you know what? Excuse the pun, I'm going to give you another yarn. Okay? Now, the Chinese were said to dominate the trade in silk. They were said to be the only people on the planet creating silk. Now, we don't really know that, and it's really unlikely that they're the only people that ever come across it. What we do know in human civilization is that, as we saw with the Aksumite Kingdom, you might find a certain type of pottery created in the Aksumite Kingdom, with the nice little spouts and the handles and all the rest of it from 2,000 years ago, and something exactly the same as being created in Peru um, in 1,500 years ago. It's, it, there, there's no links between the same people. But there's no links between the two people, but they're creating the same type of product. It's called determinism. They, they determine what they're going to make without any links with any other culture. For example, Peter and Paul finds a piece of, a nugget of gold, right? Um, in, in Scotland. You find that's a nice nugget of gold. If we bang it enough, we can create a nice little um, um, helmet out of it, right? So you, can get quite, you can get quite a big area out of one nugget of gold. And you do that 2,000 years ago. And in Ireland at the same time, they find another nugget of gold and they do exactly the same. It's called determinism. There's no links. So there's no, why is it that archaeologists are obsessed with, with the silk just coming from China? And I think that's the next exploration, to try and work out whether that silk in Germany, the examples in Egypt and England and elsewhere in the world, did that silk truly originate from China? And that's the next experiment. That's the next um, step in the journey of archaeology involving silk. We're going to do the yarn after your question. Go on. Okay, well, yeah. how, how do you explain the image in South America, Egypt, Asia, Bosnia, all of this kind of You're doing... Is that you're the or is that... Uh, can, can, I, can I... You're doing a Von Daniken, but I hope you're not doing a Von Daniken. And the reason... I'm going to do this in the most bombastic... Um, authoritarian way I can possibly but Von Daniken was a guy writing in the 50s and 60s about, about sort of you know different people from different planets coming down and whatever I'm going to do it this way right our ancestors were highly intelligent and by saying that they could not create the Nazca lines is insulting to our ancestors right by saying they can't create the uh, Uffington Horse or Stonehenge is highly insulting to our ancestors, right? Um, and in the past, we got these pyramids um, in Mesopotamia, Egypt, Central America, as you've just mentioned, 
all the way around the world. Um, and we see it as human evolution. Different parts of the world, their minds say, that's where we've got to go next. The, the easiest form to get higher up into the sky is to create a pyramid. That's where you get closest to God. And that is the best form and shape to create to actually get closer to the gods. And it's, 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 it's the way we've evolved. Our mindset has said that's what we've got to do. At different times, the, the first pyramids, um, for example, in Central, Central America, were no more than 2,000 years ago. In ancient Egypt, they were 4,600 years ago. Um, what I mean by determinism, our minds determine that's where we're going to evolve, with no links between any other people. But, there's a big but here, there's lots of people out there that feel that technology is moving between countries and civilizations over different time scales. Um, I'm one of those archaeologists that university trained, and then before that I wasn't university trained, um, and I take the middle road. And we're going to finish the answer to this question now. When I went to Cyprus many, many years ago, and uh, this was about 1989, I went into a museum right, in Cyprus, and there was this wonderful carving, right? And this carving looked exactly the same as a statue that I'd seen in a book that I'd been reading before I went out to Cyprus. There's a statue that I'd seen uh, on display um, in a catalogue in a museum in Central America, exactly the same design. Um, so um, people are creating similar things at similar times and at different times. But I would say that our human ancestors are determining that that's where they should go. They're not being influenced by aliens and all the rest of it. It's where they're evolving. Whether there's any links between these people, um, I'm just going to leave that up to, for they, you. And I, I didn't discount that. Do you know? Yeah. Do you know? Do you know what? Right? Do you know what? Exactly. You've seen it in China. There, 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 there is one thing. When about in the 1980s, they were they were trawling in the Rio de Janeiro harbour, right? And I had a good friend over there called Fernanda years ago, and and uh, she said to me, she said, "Look what been in the newspaper." And she she sent me this cutting over from Brazil, and she said, "Archaeologists have found in the harbour of Rio de Janeiro Roman amphora." And, and, and I think she writes, well, uh, the Europeans didn't discover America until the 1490s, did they? But we've got Roman amphora in the harbour at Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And at that moment, the archaeologists had their um, pottery taken away from them. Um, it was put under lock and key, and they wouldn't say any more. Does that answer your question? Cool. The, these, these, can I do my yarn now? Thank you. My yarn is this. Go on, what, what if you say that's a terrible pun? Um, it said that sometime around the Justinian plague in the 540s, just before that, um, there was a Byzantine monk who travelled all the way over to China to work out the secrets of silk. And he couldn't work it out, nobody would tell him, until he went into a garden and he, and he saw this woman unravelling a cocoon, right, like this. It's probably the Empress. Uh, is unravelling a cocoon, right? And a cup of tea at the side, yeah. And another one fell in the, and he saw bingo, I've worked it out. Um, and, and at night, he snuck into that garden, right? He nicked all the cocoons out of the mulberry tree, right? And he put them in a jam jar, Heinz 57 variety jam jar. He put them in a jam jar, right? And he carried this jam jar all the way back from China, all the way up through the Hindu Kush, all the way through into Iran, all the way through um, 
into um, Jerusalem, got a boat from Jerusalem over to Cyprus, and then Cyprus all the way back to Byzantium, right? Um, it only took him eight months, right? But he did it. Um, and then the Byzantine Empire knew the secrets of silk. And they had all these mulberry bushes and all these uh, wonderful moths, and they were able to have their own silk industry, right? There's one problem with that. Um, those little grubs would have been would have been dead, dead within weeks anyway. Um, they, they 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 would have died anyway. They couldn't have, he couldn't have got them back. He just could not have got them back. Um, they may have got mulberry trees back, but the grubs would have been another thing. And it's probably likely that they found other ways and other insects and other moths to create their silk in Europe. That's why we're starting to have our own silk in Europe by about four or five hundred. But, but it's not really been answered. It's, it's that very delicate silk that they're finding on these archaeological sites that needs to be looked at to try to understand where the silk is coming from. Those are the great questions. There's, there's, there's more of that map. You can see a bit more clearly. Why didn't any of you tell me that this went off ages ago? It was concentrating on this. Oh, that's good. I'll give you that now. Um, appar apparently, um, I, 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 I've seen, I've seen the. Um, Yeah, this is the map. Yeah, it's, this this is this is another. Um, this is this is the um, this is the map on Bwagi, um, No, Mao Wan Gai Dai map. Map on Bwagi, the South Africa, um, Zimbabwe. Uh, this is actually showing the map as well. Um, and how big is this map? I, I've said it, I've read the scriptures that this is this is a very large map in, indeed, larger than that area there. Um, it's, it said it's several square metres, but I need to go back to that because I actually didn't believe what I was reading. But this, again, is that map. Um, you can actually see that um, you, you've got all the little streams and all the rest of it. It looks very flowery, but that's basically the map again. It does, it does. It does. That is, that is definitely the map. Um, and the map, the map itself dates again from 100 years BC. So silk itself surviving over 2,000 years. Moving again. Uh, I'll have to work out the scale on that one. Um, I didn't actually believe it when I read it. Um, we obviously know um, lots more about the silk industry from um, the various wonderful colour illustrations the um, Chinese are creating um, on their porcelain, and the Chinese are creating on their um, wonderful textile works. And you can see um, five ladies uh, working the silk there. Silk isn't always white and pure like that. It can come in a number of different strands and shades. Um, eventually, um, in India, this Indian uh, silk, dating from about AD, um, this type of silk, this, this is produced now, but the, this colour yarn um, would give the colour dating from about AD 600. Silk itself was being manufactured on a mass scale um, in India. Uh, this is no, these are known as uh, silk fibers from the uh, Sapura silk mills, which are actually being produced today. But that's based on fibers that date back to about AD 600, which is 1,400 years ago. And again, this. Um, when we when we looked at the Aksumite um, images um, from the other week, I mentioned that uh, you've got the start of the Silk Route here, but on an early stage, it didn't go across land here. It went across land here to, into India, and then to be traded um, via the Sea Route all the way to the Aksumite Kingdom, which is over here, into the Red Sea, into the Roman world. And again... Silk itself is the leveller of empires. Silk links the Roman Empire 
uh, Roman, Roman Empire with China, the Chinese Empire then with India, and the um, Egyptians, all this is linked. So there's a commonality. It's almost as if um, even though these states are warring, they're still trading their silk. Which goes to go with a modern adage, doesn't it? Um, you know, there are, there are always people across nations um, that are supporting certain things, you know. There's people in this country who would like to sell arms to the Russians, and people in Russia would like to sell arms to us. Mm. Silk, w w silk was, was like the arms industry of the day. Everybody still continued trading silk. Whoever was winning, whoever was losing, it was a leveller. And that's really, really important. And again, show, showing, showing the determination of these, these worlds. Um, you know, you're talking about, other, other than South America and North America, this, this is the vast majority of the inhabited part of the world. Okay? Um, and you can see that three of the great empires, in AD 1, which is moments after the birth of Christ, Roman Empire... The Pantheon Empire, um, Persian Empire, and China, again, running all the way across this landscape, is one single thread. The one single thread of silk. And I'd like to actually finish on this image today. Uh, none of you can read the description above. And I think this is really, really important. Um... Across the world, there have been many artefacts found relating to different cultures, and they're out of place. And I think that's more or less what the point you were making, wasn't it? Not just about building temples and structures, it's about links to do with other civilizations. And over the years, Roman coins have been found in China and Japan. And then we find similar coins from India and China being found in Britain. And they're always explained away. Always explained away. However, you can't explain this away. This is a green glass cup about so big, um, unearthed at a Han tomb in Jiajing in China, um, relating to a very wealthy nobleman or noblewoman in China. And this itself is glass, it's intact, and this originates from Syria, which was part of the Roman world in AD 100. And this manages to make its way to a tomb in China, completely intact. So if you want to see links in culture, it's this glass artifact. This glass artifact ended in the tomb in AD 100. It was made in the Roman world and it ended up in China. And if that's not evidence of links between cultures, I do not know what is. On that note, we're going to call this a day today. And I've got to be honest with you, it was really warm in this room when we started. It's bloody perishing now. Paul and Peter, lights! Lights, Paul, please. Ton of pandy cup found in the river. Um, are there... You enjoyed it, yeah? Uh, this has been a really difficult one. So next week, well, next week we are going to do. Okay, closely, this is all. Uh, we're going to do the the, uh, the Vikings in Scotland. Now I have got somebody else working on another title for the following week. 
We're not going to do the Vikings again for months and months. I can't keep doing the Vikings, Brian. Okay. okay? But actually, uh, it's something we wanted you to do the upgrades of Malta, and we love that. Uh, but I can't suggest that. I'll put that in your minds. Um, so hopefully see you all next week. Um, is that nobody sat down in Barry and said, right, what we're going to do, we're going to start mining coal across the world, and everybody across the world starts mining coal because somebody in Barry says they're going to do it. What happens is that, say, somebody in Barry's going to mine coal, somebody in Barry's, or someone in Poland's going to mine coal, right? But somewhere along their way, they might discuss what they're doing. But that's, that's known as determinism. Diffusionism is another thing that um, everything originates from Africa. So um, human civilization originated from Africa. Now the Chinese are saying, no, it didn't. Um, so the Chinese are going along the determinist thoughts, and the European archaeologists go far from the diffusionist thought, where everything comes from one area. I don't think everything comes from one area. I think we've evolved uh, independently, some with links, some not with links, okay? But eventually we get there. That's what I say. So I'm not dismissing anything. But what I'm saying is that nobody's got a right to say that, um, you know, somebody come up with an idea and it's gone everywhere like that. I think human beings are intelligent enough to work these things out themselves. Yes, yes, exactly the same necessity. We've got the same need to keep our homes warm, so we're building that way. Like, like the um, Anastasi... To build square buildings to keep themselves in the shade. So did people in Qatar in Turkey. They did the same thing. So did people in Egypt. They did the same thing um, all over the place. You know, the Aksumite Kingdom, right? The Aksumite Kingdom um, had influences from all over the place. You've, you've all seen that. They had influences from all over the place. But they made their civilization the way they wanted to make it. They didn't care about what you said, but they had little influences from everywhere else. And I think maybe along the way. That's what um, is the case, you know. We, 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 we've got lots of influences all over the place. So... Dangerous. Dangerous. But we won't have that for a while, okay? Because it's not your turn yet. Or it might be. documentary a few months ago on a little village in China or somewhere. Old boy in his 70s making silk out of what he eats. He had the worms that were up in a trough and he, he eats it all up and he was pulling the silk off. His daughters were hand weaving it yeah. and what? he was making rolls. Mm -hmm. His whole family was had been making rolls to the same in the same way, they've done for hundreds and two hundreds of years. Just with old sticks and old them, you know, create stuff. Well, all of them, don't buy that either. Yeah, that's just about money to carry. Was that clear? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah.